Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. Here, an artist's conception of how the feat was accomplished. A three-stage rocket. Number one, the booster in the class of an intercontinental missile. Its weight estimated at 50 tons. The smaller second stage took over at 5,000 miles an hour and carried on to the highest point reached. 500 miles up, the artificial moon is boosted to a speed counterbalancing the pull of gravity and released. You are hearing the actual signals transmitted by the Earth-circling satellite, one of the great scientific feats of the age. And I told Hack, I said, hey, I just saw Sputnik. And I said, you know what we ought to do, Hack? We ought to go shoot the damn thing down. <laughs> <laughs> and now, from submarines to satellites, China Lake saw the development and support of satellites and space-related systems as logical extensions of the station's air weapons mission. It was the Navy, after all, that in the late 50s was pursuing an American orbit with the notoriously troubled Vanguard. When Sputnik entered the world's lexicon in such spectacular manner in October 1957, China Lakers decided to either shoot the thing down or catch up with it. Their attempt to catch up is fondly remembered as Notznik. With only the vaguest permission and without access to large rocket boosters, China Lake took a radical approach, air launch. Officially under Project Pilot, the Knots crew hastily assembled, using only what was available in-house, not only a launch vehicle, but an orbital payload to go with it. Unlike the smooth-lined, spark-spitting Buck Rogers spaceships of the era, Knotsnik looked more like something made out of the leftovers from several dissimilar construction sets. But it worked, by some accounts. Notsnik launched China Lake into the space race. Knots supported Explorer and other satellite projects of the era, many of which remain little known. And Knots probes, such as Tabstone and HiTab, conducted experiments in support of pure science and military applications, from exospheric ionic composition to passive missile launch detection. Notsnik soon gave way to the more polished and sophisticated Caleb vehicle which China Lake used to conduct and support studies and experiments with peculiar names like Hi Ho and Dixie Pixie, and more ominous designations like Project Cerberus. Far in advance of Star Wars and the Air Force's ASAT, China Lake had designed and begun testing an air-launched satellite killer called SIP, and the station was participating in the earliest incarnations of SDI, programs such as Defender, Skipper, and Dark Fence. During the late 1950s and early 60s, NOS designed and built portable satellite tracking stations and deployed them around the globe. The China Lake ranges also saw supersonic track testing of the Gemini capsule escape system, and later of the space shuttle escape system and various components of NASA probes and planetary landers. Early on, NOS applied its unparalleled propulsion expertise to the creation of the 1105R a prototype lunar soft landing vehicle described in the press as a bowling ball perched on a bar stool. The device was successfully tested on an ersatz lunar surface with a technologically edgy autonomous landing system. By the late 60s, most of the station's satellite and space research projects had been overcome by inter-service rivalry and mission purification. China Lake did, however, and does, continue to reach for the stars, supporting satellite link tactical systems, propulsion requirements, and a variety of exotic components and subsystems for new generations of far-flung explorers. But that's another story.
On November 15, 1957, after the launching of the USSR Sputnik 1, the Naval Ordnance Test Station presented to the chiefs of the Bureaus of Ordnance and Aeronautics its concepts concerning both ground-launched and air-launched satellite vehicles. In early March 1958, the China Lake scientists and engineers under the direction of Washington's Advanced Research Projects Agency began an accelerated study of a satellite vehicle designed to be launched from an aircraft. The developmental study of the air-launched satellite vehicle was made in anticipation of the military and scientific usefulness of small satellites in the category of about 10 pounds. The China Lake research team that explored this radical concept in space vehicles was headed by Dr. H. A. Wilcox, Assistant Technical Director for Research at China Lake. The air launch technique now under study at China Lake, will permit a satellite to be placed in a special orbit on short notice in almost any direction and from any place an aircraft can fly. This technique will thus make it possible to investigate unpredictable and temporary conditions of military and scientific interest that occasionally occur on Earth and in space. Instruments used in these investigations will be inexpensive, severely miniaturized electronic satellites such as this one. This particular satellite will be used to investigate the operation of the vehicle itself. The powerful five-stage rocket vehicle uses no moving parts and has only solid propellant rocket motors for extra reliability. It is loaded aboard the standard fighter aircraft in the same manner as a conventional gas tank. Before seeing an actual test of America's first air launch satellite, let's briefly consider some of the points that make this method unique. Well, our usual, our presently more conventional satellite vehicle takes off in the near, nearly vertical direction so as to pass through the atmosphere by the shortest possible path. Of course, it must soon begin to move in the horizontal direction so as to orbit. Otherwise, it will simply go very high and fall back to the Earth. In order to accomplish this transition from vertical to horizontal flight, the conventional system expends rocket thrust and uses jet vanes and inertial guidance systems in order to force itself over into the horizontal direction above the Earth's atmosphere. But our scheme simply lets gravity pull the trajectory down toward the horizontal as the vehicle coasts upward through the atmosphere. No moving parts are required. Also, the aircraft carries the vehicle above most of the denser atmosphere before it is launched. Hence, our system is quite simple and economical of rocket fuel. Here, let me describe the vehicle for you. The first and second stages consist of four so-called hot rock motors recently developed here at China Lake. They are placed here in a cluster. Two of them are fired for the first stage and two for the second. The third stage is a solid rocket developed by the Allegheny Ballistics Laboratory. The fourth and fifth stages are progressively smaller units recently developed here at this station. The tiny three-inch fifth-stage rocket is actually mounted inside the payload. This is the nozzle of the rocket here. This is the fourth stage with its nozzle. An important trick is to mount the fifth stage with its nozzle pointing opposite to the fourth. This little trick is important in eliminating all moving parts from the vehicle. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Except for the important third stage, all the rocket stages are fired by simple electronic timing circuits. 
The third stage is fired by a horizon sensing telescope with the skin and fins then The round is complete, 15 feet long, 30 inches in diameter, weighing about 2,000 pounds. Now the launch sequence begins with the F-4D fighter aircraft pulling up into a loft maneuver at high altitude, about 35,000 feet. When the airplane reaches the correct altitude, speed, and angle, instruments within the aircraft release the vehicle, and it falls away. The aircraft continues to pull out as the vehicle coasts upward through the air. After five seconds, the timer within the vehicle ignites the first rocket stage. Twenty seconds after that, it ignites the second stage. These stages give the vehicle sufficient velocity to coast upward into very thin air for about 100 seconds to an altitude of about 50 miles. Here, let me describe it on the blackboard. This is the Earth. This is the North Polar Cap, the South Pole. This is the vehicle's climbing trajectory. Stage one is fired here, stage two here. When the vehicle reaches the peak of its climbing trajectory, it's traveling nearly horizontally. Also, throughout the climbing trajectory, the vehicle is spinning slowly as a result of our designing the fins to be canted to induce roll. The horizon sensing telescope is rigidly mounted in the vehicle and rolling with it. It looks out from the axis of the vehicle at an angle of about 12 degrees. This telescope revolving with the vehicle, detects the Earth's horizon when the trajectory elevation angle reaches a correct and critical predetermined value. At that point, the third rocket stage is ignited. This method of igniting the third rocket stage eliminates many trajectory errors and gives the vehicle the necessary precision of direction for its remaining functional operation. When the third stage is ignited, it shears the connections to the spent hot rock motors and launches itself and the forward parts of the vehicle from inside the surrounding fairing. The spin induced by the canted fins is great enough to stabilize this relatively fat section. The fourth stage is immediately fired away from the spent parts of the third stage, and the payload thus acquires the speed necessary to make it orbit the Earth, about 19,000 miles per hour. Shortly after the fourth stage is fired, a squib separates it from the payload, which is then allowed to coast for 3,200 seconds. 53 minutes, halfway around the Earth. During this coast period, the payload remains spin-stabilized, like this. If we do nothing here, the satellite will necessarily return to the atmosphere at this point. To prevent that, we add speed here in this direction. The fifth stage is fired, pointing this way, opposite to the other stages. And that completes the job. The pilot satellite is then in orbit. The pilot vehicle can be fired from any place over the ocean into either an equatorial or a polar orbit. But our primary aim has been to develop a very inexpensive and reliable satellite system, always ready for instant firing. 
The air launch concept may be simple to grasp, but the search for the right design of a vehicle of ordnance quality that will carry special payloads into any orbit at any time and from anywhere on Earth has led to a new and difficult area in space research. The first payload for the vehicle was a 2.2 pound telemetering package designed to furnish information on the flight performance of the vehicle itself and thus determine the adequacy of missile design, including the equilibrium temperature of the payload while in orbit. The payload's fiberglass skin was molded into the shape of a cake pan, two inches deep and eight inches in diameter. Before the electronics were inserted, the package was filled with a foam potting compound. Slots and partitions were cut into the potting compound to house the batteries and electronic components. The telemetering satellite consisted of an FM transmitter, three FM subcarrier oscillators, sensors for temperature and acceleration, and a battery pack with a 30-hour life. After the system was checked out, the components were potted, the fifth stage motor was inserted, and the package was ready for assembly into the vehicle. The fabrication of metal parts for the air-launched vehicle demanded extreme care in eliminating weight without sacrificing structural integrity. Rocket motor parts were machined close to the limits of containing the pressure. To compensate for high temperatures, the motor nozzles were sprayed with a lightweight ceramic coating. The four-stage motor chamber, 18 inches long and 8 inches in diameter, had walls 25 thousandths of an inch thick. While the front hemispherical section was welded to the body of the motor chamber, the nozzle section was riveted on after the propellant charge was inserted. This design furnished a lightweight motor chamber with strength to withstand pressures in excess of 1,000 pounds per square inch. Standard fabrication methods were not employed in the construction of some of the components. Some parts were machined from solid blocks of materials, as were the frames for the fins. After machining, the lightweight aluminum frames were covered with stainless steel sheet metal. Then the air spaces inside were filled with a foam potting compound to give rigidity without excessive increase in weight. This construction withstood static tests duplicating flight bending moments of 1,350 pound-feet. Similar is the construction of the fairing that surrounds the third stage ABL motor. The aluminum support structure weighs 20 pounds. With the steel sheet metal skin, the complete fairing weighs 40 pounds. Despite this construction's light weight, it withstood an axial compression load of over 40,000 pounds and bending moment load of over 10,000 pound-feet. The propellant grains for the five-stage vehicle were newly developed here at the China Lake Propulsion Laboratories, except for the third-stage motor developed by the Allegheny Ballistics Laboratory. The first and second stages are internal burning grains and are extruded JPN propellant. Each of these grains, 71 inches long and about 12 inches in diameter, weighs 330 pounds. Each motor produces over 14,000 pounds thrust for 4 and 8 tenths seconds. After extrusion, the ends of the grains were machined to the internal shape of the motor chamber. The same methods were used in the extrusion and machining of the fourth and fifth stage internal burning grains. The tiny fifth stage motor, designed to be permanently attached to the payload, has a grain weighing three quarters of a pound and is made from X14 propellant. The motor weighs one and a quarter pounds, is three inches in diameter, and delivers 172 pounds of thrust for one second. After extrusion and machining, all the motors were spray inhibited with a polyester resin material and a silicone polymer, then wrapped with glass cloth, which held the silicone polymer in an even distribution over the surface of the grain. The motor grains were then sprayed again with the silicone polymer. 
The outside diameter of the propellant charges were purposely made larger than the inside diameter of the motor chambers. However, cooling the grains to plus 10 degrees Fahrenheit made them small enough to slide inside the motor chamber, which was held at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. After warming the grain to 70 degrees, the silicone coated grains expanded against the case, thus obturating the charges. Before the first live vehicles were assembled, each component underwent tests to simulate the loads the vehicle would experience in actual flight. This particular component, which supports the weight of the entire 2,000 pound vehicle, withstood tension loads up to 11,000 pounds. On the station's supersonic test track, the fins concurrently withstood flight aerodynamic loads and accelerations of 25 Gs. Wind tunnel tests to ensure that the design would permit clean separation from the aircraft were run at the California Institute of Technology. At the China Lake static firing facility, motors were fired to determine thrust levels and to ensure that the chamber pressures would not exceed the structural limits of the metal part. This four-stage motor produced over 1,000 pounds thrust for five and seven-tenths seconds. The fifth-stage motor delivers 172 pounds of thrust for one second. The horizon scanner used to trigger the ignition of the third-stage motor underwent a series of tests to check its performance. Over the China Lake test ranges, full-scale, weighted dummy vehicles were released to gather further information on the aircraft separation and to train the test pilots in the launch maneuver. The assembly of the first live vehicles began five months after the initiation of the program. The assembly of each of the exploratory vehicles took six men approximately 14 hours. Obviously, the first design did not, in many ways, meet the handling requirements of an ordnance item. The first step in the creation of the futuristic satellite vehicle did not permit such a design, although many of the ideas were applicable in the fabrication of the ultimate vehicle. Basically, the ultimate design, if it is to fulfill future needs, must meet the handling and assembly requirements of conventional ordnance, and at the same time not sacrifice the reliability of the vehicle or of the reconnaissance or exploratory satellites that pilot will carry into any of the selected orbits. While this first design will not in many ways resemble the ultimate vehicle, the accelerated exploration of the air launch concept has established the feasibility of an inexpensive, dependable satellite vehicle of ordnance quality. The China Lake military civilian research team has penetrated a new problem area in space research. This penetration has not only offered the opportunity to define the new problems, but it has also introduced to the pilot research team new skills and methods of solving these problems. The pilot exploration has indicated the feasibility of developing an ordnance type satellite easily assembled, rugged, and capable of carrying payloads up to 10 pounds. In this way, pilot will extend the military air arm of the nation into space.
In the role as free world leader of peaceful scientific endeavor, our country is committed to the exploration of space. Announcement of Project Apollo verifies a large scale, organized effort directed toward a manned expedition on the surface of the moon. Technology from government laboratories and private industry are jointly contributing to accomplish this goal. As one of the contributing sources, the United States Naval Ordnance Test Station has been investigating methods of softly landing a vertically descending vehicle. With the Knotts variable thrust rocket engine as the key component, a practicable method of decelerating a vehicle was conceived in 1958. By 1960, studies had led to design of the 1105R, a test vehicle with the objective of demonstrating that a soft landing could be achieved through precision control of the variable thrust motor. The fabricated 1105R stands eight feet high and weighs 700 pounds in fully loaded condition. Four rocket fuel tanks holding 125 pounds of unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine slope down from the nitrogen pressurization tank at the top. 175 pounds of uninhibited red fuming nitric acid is stored in the center tank. The tanks have another function by serving as an integral support of the vehicle structure. The variable thrust rocket engine is located immediately under the oxidizer tank. Cables suspended from a tower restricted testing to a vertical course. Inside a bunker, an operator simulating pilot control regulates the motor thrust output. In the first flight test of the 1105R, the primary objective was to determine to what degree of precision the vehicle's velocity and position could be controlled. The 1,100-pound thrust motor raised the vehicle to an altitude of 50 feet. Then by thrust control, it lowered and hovered at the 30-foot level. Finally, descending to a soft landing at a touchdown velocity of five feet per second. This test conclusively proved the original objective of precision variable thrust control. In the second demonstration, a camera was installed in the control system to record the type of background visible to the scanner. Pilot control elevated the vehicle to 130 feet. Again, by variations of thrust control, the operator held at the 70 and 15 foot levels. With a more powerful 1,250 pound thrust engine, the next test vehicle called for terminating the thrust at 135 feet and allowing the powerless vehicle to free fall. By applying thrust, the pilot was able to halt the descent at the halfway mark. The landing was negotiated at eight feet per second. Vibration from the more powerful engine did not affect the scanner operation. On the following day, a fourth and final test took place where the descent of the vehicle would be controlled for the first time by the optical guidance package. Under guidance system control, the vehicle was decelerated. However, due to excess slack in the cable, it was allowed to translate, thus confusing the single scanner system. This required switching to a pilot control landing at a rate of 3.8 feet per second. After touchdown, 
a malfunction of the servo valve resulted in full thrust of the engine, consequently destroying the vehicle. In summary, the 1105-R served its function well, and from its existence we learned these facts. Position and velocity of a vertically descending vehicle can be controlled precisely enough to softly land a vehicle at velocities of less than four feet per second. An optical guidance system can automatically control engine thrust. Early testing of Apollo vehicle components, along with lunar simulation experiments, are immediate requisites if we are to assure success of our nation's scheduled moon surface landing in 1967. Development of these proposed vehicles would well provide a long stride toward fulfillment of this task. As its name indicates, the S-6 satellite is to make measurements on whatever atmosphere it finds in orbit at about 350 miles altitude. Therefore, no gaseous material can be ejected, for example, for attitude control, and the satellite must be stable. The satellite is launched with guided first and second stage boosters. However, the last, or injection stage, is spin stabilized, as is the satellite itself after final separation from the spent booster. It is the stability during these unguided periods under certain adverse conditions which concerns us here. Now, if we spin the top in this direction, <coughs> our right hand rule will show us that the angular momentum vector points up this way. Now, if we apply a torque by pushing on the axis this way, there's a reaction in the bearing, and our right-hand rule, again, shows us that the torque vector points this way. We will expect, then, that the axis of the top will rotate in this direction. Let's see if it does. If we reverse the torque, the axis will precess in the opposite direction. Notice that as long as the torque is applied, the precession continues. When the torque stops, the precession stops. Now this is the case so long as the torque is applied and released gently. However, if we give it an impulsive torque such as this, we notice that the axis jumps in the direction in which it is expected. However, the top is left with this free rotary oscillation, variously called nutation, free precession, gyration, or just plain wobble. Incidentally, if we have a top <coughs> in which the center of gravity is displaced either above or below the center of support, such as this one, 
there will be a continuous outside torque so long as the top is tipped over. And we will have this continuous rotary precession due to the forced outside torque. However, we can give it an impulsive torque. And we see now that the free rotary precession is superimposed upon the forced circular precession. This motion is very much like a projectile in air. Now for a final important point. Here we have two space vehicle dynamical simulators, which are identical, except that in this one, the rings are placed close, close together so that the transverse moment of inertia is less than the polar moment of inertia. Polar moment A, transverse moment B, and the ratio in this top is 1.2 or greater than 1. For this top, the rings have been separated so that the transverse moment of inertia B has been increased <coughs> until it is greater than the polar moment A. Here, the ratio is 0.7 or less than 1. <coughs> now let us spin them up and see if we can determine differences in their performance. I will attempt to spin them to about the same amount of spin. I will give them each a small amount of nutation. I hope that you can see that the nutational speed in this one is faster than the spin, and in this one the nutation is slower than the spin. In particular, though, notice that the amplitude of nutation in each case remains very nearly constant, neither increasing nor decreasing. Now this is because both tops are very nearly rigid bodies. Now let us change the situation by adding a small amount of weight. <coughs> this bob is probably less than 1% of the total weight of the top. We then will no longer have rigid bodies, but we will have coupled systems. Again, I will try to spin them to about the same amount of spin. We see that the nutation dies out in this top, whereas in this top, the nutation is increasing slowly but surely. Until finally, it hits the stops. And in a space vehicle, it would be a complete tumble or a rotation about the transverse axis. We conclude then that for a spinning symmetrical body, a nutation will damp out if the moment of inertia ratio is greater than one, but will undamp if the ratio is less than one. Here is the damper unit mounted in the top of the open satellite. This is the device for holding and releasing the pendulums. A pin extending in the pendulum tip is retracted by the piston actuators, electrically initiated. Let's release them now by throwing this switch. For evaluating nutation damping effectiveness, this experimental arrangement was used. The prototype satellite is spun up by means of a wheel on a half inch drill, and nutations are induced by hand. In this run, Nutations will damp about as expected in orbit. The camera sees directly a side view of the satellite in which the spindle is projected on a one-dimensional scale. An overhead mirror affords a top view in which the spindle is seen behind a grid, providing a two-dimensional record of the nutation. Note that the clock has an auxiliary split-second hand, which rotates once a second. The reduced data shown here in the form of X and Y components of nutation as function of spin angle. Surely, efficient passive devices, fluid or mechanical, designed on these basic principles will find application in future space vehicles.